So today it's uh, our pleasure to have Jan Wang um, as our speaker. Uh, Jan is a PhD student in the Department of Statistics. He earned his first PhD in physics at Beijing Normal University in, in 2010. After that, he served as a faculty member um, at Chinese University of Petroleum before coming to Ames in 2017 for his second PhD. Uh, his research interests are mainly about applying stochastic and statistical method in science and engineering. Uh, please stay around for a little bit after the, the talk for Q&A with Jan. Thank you, Jan, for taking the time today, and please go ahead and get started. Thank you. Thank you for providing me this chance to share my recent work in water study subsampling. Uh, this is a joint work with Professor Dan Adelton and, and uh, Xiaojuan Ma in computer science department. Uh, to be honest, it's actually a still an ongoing work, but I would like to share uh, some of our results with you. My talk will consist of four parts with the first motivating example and then the theory and some numerical results and finally the conclusion. The main concern in this work is that the prediction with a limited budget. You know, previously I worked in the Department of Petroleum Engineering and that at that time, one of our main tasks is to measure the mechanical properties of several rock samples. And one of the most important one is the compressive strength, which because it's uh, strongly re relevant to the petroleum development. So in order to get these parameters, we have to do a lot of experiments. Some of the exper experiments are relatively easy and almost cost nothing because we had a device. We had device to measure density and dynamic parameters. However, for other parameters, they're extremely hard uh, to get because we don't have the, the device to do the experiment like this one, which costs about 300,000 US dollars. And usually we have to make appointments before we can do the experiment. And that will take about 20 days. And once we have the machine, we will pay $100 per hour per rock sample to do the experiment. And for this two, for the static Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio, it typically takes one hour to finish the experiment. But for our major concern here, the, compress the compressive strength, it usually takes five hours. And what's, what's worse is that this experiment is destructive in the sense that after the experiment, the rock sample is destroyed and cannot be used to measure any other parameters yet. Uh, also, there is a chance of failure. That is to say, after five hours of work and after pa paying $500, we get nothing. So it's really, really costly. And if we only have a limited budget, how can we manage this in a more efficient way? One thing that is fortunate is that, is that uh, all of these parameters are not totally independent. It might be appealing idea, it might be an appealing idea that if we can construct a prediction model based on density and dynamic and static parameters to predict the compressive strength, then we can save a lot of money and time. And that, that's really important. But in order to do that, we have to first have a training set. That is to say, we only have a fraction of compressive strength to measure. And based on this measure, the compressive strength, as well as the, the other parameters, we can construct a prediction model. And use that model, we can do the prediction. Now the problem here is that we can use all the information in density and dynamic parameters and static parameters, and as well as several compressive strengths to come up with a model and use them to predict the unknown compressive strength. So the problem here are two. First is how could we select which rock sample to measure the compressive strength? And 
after this uh, rock samples are measured, we and we establish a model how to quantify the prediction error uh, by doing this subsampling. To put this problem in mathematics, we define that we have a feature space X. In this case, the feature space is just the information of density and the dynamic and static parameters. And also, there is a response space Y. Here, it's just the, the uh, compressive strength. And after defining feature space and the response space, we have an instance space by putting them together. What we know here is the information of xi, i through one, uh, i equals one through n. That is, we know all the information here. And also, since we only have a limited budget, we only have m out of n y i's to be measured. And now our aim is that we want to select m pairs of x and y's and use them to construct a predictor. And we want to uh, have a interval estimation of the predicted value. So this is the, our, our, our starting point of the, of the work. So is, is there any question? Uh, just a quick uh -huh. cl clarification question. So the, the budget only applies to the Y. It doesn't apply to the features, right? Well, actually, uh, in realistic situations, it also applies to the features. But as we see here, they are the features can be can be obtained in uh, in a relatively uh, less expensive way. So the the main part of the budget should spend on the, the on, on on the response. Okay, thank you. Um, you're welcome. So let's proceed. This this now is be, becoming a a mathematical problem. We have to make some assumptions first. Uh, the first assumption is that, as usual, we assume data is generated from a underlying distribution mu in an IID way. In this work, since we are mainly focused on the regression problem, so we assume that every uh, the, the, the underlying distribution is continuous. That is to say that the, the features are continuous and the response is also continuous. Also, we assume that the instance space Z is bounded. Also, if we have a predictor and we feed X into the predictor to have a, a predictive value of Y, and then there is a loss function to define the loss. And all of this is denoted as F of Z, because Z consists of two parts, the X feature and the Y response, and F is actually uh, containing the information of the predictor as well as the loss function. But as long as Z is given and F is picked, we assume that it's bounded. And also we assume that F is not only bounded, it's, it's Lipschitz uh, with the Lipschitz constant LF. In our example of the rock compressive strength, the density and uh, the other parameters are all bounded, theoretically or empirically. For example, the Poisson's ratio is theoretically bounded by uh, in between 0 and 0 0.5, and other quantities are also empirically bounded. And in this case, if we select a linear regression model and with squared error loss, we can check that they are bounded, and the loss is bounded, as well as the, the gradient of the loss. So all the assumptions can be satisfied in a realistic setting. So this is our basic assumptions for the problem. Then we can define uh, the risk with respect to some probability measure when f of z is given. The risk with respect to the underlying mu is denoted as this term and with, uh, and that respect, with respect to the empirical distribution mu n is denoted like this. For the, uh, for the empirical distribution of n points, since we always assume that a, they are generated in an IID way, so it can, be represent, it can be written in this form. And also there is a risk with respect to the 
subsample empirical distribution, which is defined to be this. Here, the points are selected. Each point, however, each point is, is not necessarily having the, having the same weight. But of course, each, each weight should be non-negative and sum up to, to one. Then we have a basic risk bound for the, uh, with, uh, for, 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 the, for the for the empirical distribution uh, for the subsample sub 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 of the empirical distribution mu m and mu they are bounded by the uh, tri triangle inequality bounded by these two terms the second term on the right hand side is actually the risk bound uh, is the risk dis difference between mu n and mu since mu is unknown so this term is not known However, as long as we fix a predictor f, uh, no, not predictor, we fix f, which is uh, a composition of loss function and predictor actually. As long as f is fixed, this term is fixed, even though it's not unknown. So our task boils down to minimizing the first term. The first term, we have the freedom to choose m points and construct a uh, and predict distribution for this endpoints. Here, our aim to uh, to minimize. Then we have the first theorem here under our uh, uh, assumptions, and for any uh, probability measure nu that is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, we have the the risk the risk difference bounded by the minimum of of these two terms, the, th the, the first term is, rel uh, is related to the Wasserstein distance. Uh, this will be uh, defined on the next page. And the second term is related to the KL divergence from nu to mu. It will also be defined next. Uh, here, the sigma f mu is the sub Gaussian norm of, of the quantity fz. Since we have assumed that f is bounded, so it's uh, it's sub Gaussian, it's absolutely sub Gaussian, and we can define its sub Gaussian norm in this way. The KL divergence, by definition, is thin, and the Wasserstein distance we used in theorem one is defined here. Actually, uh, this means. This this uh, simply it means the Euclidean norm. By definition, Wasserstein distance uh, between mu and nu minimizes the the coupling between the probability measure mu and nu, such that this quantity is is minimized. By doing so, actually, we can see that we establish a connection between the geometric structure in the probability space and that in the data space. Because here, w, w1 mu nu measures the distance between two probabilities. However, here, z, and z minus z prime measures the distance between two data points. Actually, we, actually the Wasserstein distance is, has this good property that it, it preserves somehow the the ge geometric structure in the data space, in the uh, in the data space, to the to the probability space. Also, by the duality representation, the Wasserstein distance can also be re written in this form, where uh, h is a function that is Lipschitz with the Lipschitz constant one. Another good property of Wasserstein distance is that it can be well defined between discrete and continuous probability measures. And this is very important in establishing the risk bound. Since, uh, since here, since here we, the mu m is discrete and a mu is assumed to be, in most general cases, a continuous. And we want to bound this risk in terms of the Wasserstein distance. It's, good, uh, it's, it's doable because the Wasserstein distance between, a empiric, uh, between a discrete measure and a continuous measure is, is well defined. However, other distance uh, uh, metrics uh, like total variation or actually or actually 
KL divergence are, are not that well defined. So based on theorem one, we have that the, 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 the risk difference between the empirical distribution of n points and that of the subsampled n points is bounded by this. It's just simply a direct application of theorem one. Uh, I, I will not address the, the proof details uh, in this talk. I just want to um, uh, give a give an overall uh, view of of the results we have. Then we have a uh, the theorem two. This is uh, this is quite straightforward because we can minimize the KL divergence between mu m and mu n by setting every point that we subsampled with an equal weight, that is one divided by m. And basically this is a, a, a manifestation of the maximum entropy principle. And in this case, we can calculate that the KL divergence between equally weighted m points, no matter how they are subsampled, and that with, uh, with, uh, with uh, and, and, the mu m, if mu m is given in this way, and no, ma no matter how m points are selected, then the KL divergence between this and mu n is minimized by log n divided by n. But here we notice that uh, it, this is this is a uh, uh, this is a property in the instance space. However, if we assume that the data are generated in a in a way that we sample x first and then given x the the conditional distribution of p y given x is is uh, is fixed that means for every data point we have the p y given x is the same and under this condition we can see that the the kl divergence between the joint distributions is actually equal to that between the marginal distributions that is to say only in the feature space we select m points with equal weight, then the, we also achieve the, uh, the bound log n divided by m. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it should be cautious that in this case, we, we assume that the, the probability is continuous. So no two features are exactly the same. We assume this. Otherwise, there, there could be some problems. Yeah, Dr. Nettleton pointed this to me. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, in a general case, if no two points are exactly the same, this result applies. Further, we can also have a uh, result that bounds the Wasserstein distance in terms of the KL divergence. And by selecting equally weighted M points, actually this term we have seen that is it's just a log n divided by m. So we have a bound for the uh, one Wasserstein distance between mu m and mu n in terms of the KL divergence as well as the uh, sub Gaussian norm of, of z. It's not fz, it's, it's just z. z here is a vector in a high dimensional Euclidean space, but in a similar way, we can define the sub Gaussian norm here. Notice that this is the data dependent worst case bound for the one Wasserstein distance. In this inequality, as long as m points are given, no matter how we select the m points, and as long as we put equal weights to them, then this is guaranteed. Why is this useful? Because we want to establish the, establish the bound for mu m and mu, not actually not mu n. So this would be useful in the, in the following. But uh, before that, I want to uh, briefly summarize what we have er arrived uh, at so far. We start from this basic inequality. Since this term is, is, de defined, is, is, is determined by n points and unknown, un unknown mu, so it's unknown but fixed. So we want to minimize this term. By minimizing this term, we notice that it's upper bounded by this two, two guys. And this, guys, this guy can be minimized by putting 
equal weights to every point that is subsampled, and we can have the minimum uh, value of this KL divergence. On the other hand, this guy can be upper bounded by this by this quantity. Notice that this is this is not a probability uh, event. It, it, it's it's it, it happens with probability one, or we can, we can see that it's deterministic. It's represented by this. Then, by a theorem in uh, 2015, under our assumptions, actually, mu n, notice that mu n is the empirical distribution of nid sample points. The mu n and mu, their one Washington distance has a, has this high probability in quality by this result we can actually we can actually see that that is to say we if we have a mu here and a mu n here their distance we have a concentration in quality for the for, for their distance however we have known that for mu m and a mu n their distance is bounded with probability one by something then we can construct a bound for the distance between mu and mu m by the triangle inequality because this this distance because what's the distance is a real distance and the and and the distance between these two points is uh, is bounded by the sum of the distance between these two point, points but this bound but this 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 distance is bounded with probability 1 and this is bounded with this probability so we can have that mu m and mu, their Watson distance is, bound, is, is bounded with the probability inequality in this form. So by doing this, what we have, what we have, uh, we have that if we subsample m points, and no matter how we do that sub, subsampling, and we put equal weights to each point, then we have this. Uh, interval. The interval here. This is the uh, uh, this is the expected uh, risk with respect to to the mu, which is mu is unknown. However, it's bounded in between this interval. So this is a uh, this is indeed an interval. The problem is that uh, for practical use, it's not very easy to uh, to estimate each term in this. Uh, in in this expression, even though we we know that it can be bounded in some way, so how to improve this result is our uh, is our is our actually ongoing work. I'm doing something on this, but let's switch to another topic by practical considerations. How do we do the subsampling? We have seen that in, even in the worst case, even in the worst case. We can have this result, but can we possibly do better? And under what conditions can we do better? Uh, based on this uh, idea, we assume that if the geometry in the feature space can well approximate the geometry in the instance space, then we can use the we can use the water stance, water distance in the feature space to do subsampling. That is to say, by minimizing the mu m in the feature space, uh, mu, by, by, by minimizing the distance between mu xm and mu xn in the feature space, we can approximately uh, have a similar, similar uh, result in the instance space. Although, even mu xm is optimal in the feature space, mu m is not necessarily optimal in the, in the instance space, but they might be close. Based on this idea, we can do, uh, the, do the, uh, we can do the Wasserstein subsampling in the feature space. How to do that? Fortunately, there is a, there is a method called the uh, K-Midoys algorithm, because in, in, in fact, to require that mu x and mu x m, their uh, their distance is minimized. Is indeed we want to find 
several, we want to find amyloids here. For example, for example, we have 12 points here as the empirical distribution of, of, of the 12 points, of course. And by the three amyloids algorithm, we can have a subsampled empirical distribution here with each point weighted by the cluster size. And we can also put equal weights to uh, these three points. And we can do this by unweighting the, the three, three Midoids algorithm result by putting, putting equal weights here. So we can have these two versions of the uh, subsampled uh, empirical distribution. And we test the, this idea on different real data sets. We use uh, several metrics to measure, uh, to, to assess, to evaluate the performance of this sampling method. The first one is the ensemble estimation error in terms of the root mean square error. Uh, the other one is the out of sample prediction error. In the, first, in the first case, we use all the data points to do the subsampling and, the, and, and construct the model and to see, the, to see the error. And in the second case, we split the data set into the training set and the test set. And we only use the training set data to subsample and then have a fit model to, and then we apply this fitted model to the test set to see its performance. We use two different types of predictors. The first one is the linear model and the second one is the random forest. And we, we compare four different subsampling methods. The first one is the uniformly random sampling, which can serve as, as a benchmark. We also consider the leverage-based subsampling. Leverage is, uh, is defined here. Uh, and we select points by, uh, by, the, uh, by their leverage. That is to say, the higher leverage, the point with higher leverage has a higher probability, uh, not have higher probability. We select uh, the, the points with highest leverages. And also the unweighted and weighted was the, the subsampling methods. For the unweighted one, we mean that each point is equally weighted. These points are, are found by the k midoids algorithm. And for the weighted Wasserstein subsampling, we use the same points. However, they're weighted by the cluster size. Uh, it's worth no stressing that although we use K-Midoids algorithm here, we do not necessarily uh, mean that the data, data set really has a cluster structure. We only use that method to, do the, to, to find the, the mu xm. So the results are shown here, basically. For the linear model, we are somewhat uh, happy to see that using the unweighted version of the Watson subsampling, the results are are good. In fact, uh, in in the in all the cases we have found, it's it's only it's the performance of unweighted Watson uh, subsampling. Uh, it, it, there's only one case that its performance is not good. For all the other cases, its performance is good. However, uh, for random forests, uh, the, the result is not clear. Uh, my understanding of this observation is that because linear model assumes that the, a, a linear structure between uh, response and features, and this structure can, in a, in a, in a, in a Euclidean space, we, what we define in the Wasserstein distance, we use a Euclidean distance, and this distance somehow captures the underlying structure, we assume. So it works good, it works better. However, the random forest is a highly nonlinear predictor. And in that case, the, the, the data points are living on a, living on a, a manifold. The, the, the distance between them, the geodesic distance between the points are not necessarily captured by the Euclidean distance. So that might be the reason why it's not good, but uh, how to accurately quantify this uh, uh, so far is unknown. 
The next, I will show the some numerical results. Here is the linear model case, uh, and the red line represents the unweighted Wasserstein sampling result. Here is for the uh, Freeney data set. And here is the prediction error over 100 realizations. That means we split the data set 100 times at random and use the, use the, uh, training, use the training set to have a model and then test it on the test set. We do this 100 times. The error bars represents the standard deviation. We can see that uh, in this case, for, for, for very small amount of data used, the unweighted Wasserstein subsampling can perform uh, well. And here is the another, another, another data set rock. Still the red line represents the unweighted Wasserstein subsampling. And this, and this is the only data set that the, the, the unweighted Wasserstein subsampling is not satisfactory uh, compared with other sampling methods when the, when, 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 when the number of M is increased in, in, in between this. However, if we only use like uh, less than 20% of the data, then it's still good. And also the, here is the, for the air quality data set, we can see the estimation error and the red line. The still is the red line here for the water stain unweighted case. Here's the computer hardware data set. And here is for the same computer hardware data set, we can compare the linear model and the random forests. The field symbols represent linear model and the and, and on field represent the results from random forests. Here's for the yacht. Yeah, for the, uh, for the random forest predictor, it's really no uh, clear sign which sampling method is uniformly better than others. Here's the, another data set. Yeah. Forest for fire and other and concrete and airfoil and a crime community. This in this case is uh, since the data set is 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 somewhat special, somewhat different than the other data sets. So the random forest performance is even worse than the linear model performance without too much tuning of the parameters. So basically, this is the uh, numerical results I want to present. To be uh, quickly summarized, uh, in this work, we use the subsampling uh, criterion that we want to minimize the distance between the empirical distributions of mu m and mu n, where mu n is the empirical distribution of nid points, and mu m is the empirical distribution of the subsampled points. And the subsampling risk can be uniformly bounded under mute conditions. Basically, we only require a uh, boundedness and Lipschitz, and this bound is provided by the it, it expressed in terms of Wasserstein distance. Also, numerically, we found that depending on the type of predictor, uh, Wasserstein distance-based subsampling uh, in the feature space alone can perform better than other methods if. We assume we if we 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 think that if the geometry of the data data set can can be reflected in the definition of the Wasserstein distance, then this is good. Our future work can be construct constructing more useful prediction intervals. Although we have one in this work, uh, its practical value is 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 not clear. And we want to find some more useful prediction intervals with more uh, reasonable assumptions, perhaps. And also, we want to do subsampling features. Basically, 
a naive I guess is that we can do this in a simple in a in a similar way by calculating only a several feature uh, and in this case we calculate by selecting several features and we calculate the versus the distance to see which features are really important in case of uh, in, in terms of versus and distance yeah that's the that's the idea for future work and yeah, that's all for today's talk. Thanks. Uh, I want to have some more time for discussions if there's any problems. Thanks. Thank you very much, Yang. That was um, that was a great talk. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have some time for questions. Uh, <laughs> questions. I have one um, uh, myself. So you said that. Uh, at some point, you mentioned that if uh, the geometry must mm -hmm. uh, match the Wasserstein, uh, Wasserstein's uh, distance. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what is? How do you test that? With that there is a match, or there's or there is not a match. Yeah. Yeah. This is a very good question. This is what I'm thinking. Thinking right now, because we have seen that for a for for the linear model, actually, we assume that. The, the structure is linear. Then it's 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 obvious. It seems obvious that the definition in the Wasserstein distance is is consistent with that distance uh, uh, as indicated by the linear model. However, for for more complex situations, how to do that? Yeah, I don't know right now. That's that's fair enough. This is a work in progress. I appreciate thank um, you sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Um, <clears throat> this is Zhang Yanzhu, and I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, um, can you just come go back to the to the formulation at the original and uh, like uh, maybe yeah. This one? Yeah. So um, you have uh, F N and the mu N and the mu M. Mm -hmm. So the mu N. So I think the context is that you have a you have a larger data set which is the N. With yes, all the yes. uh, chief operations, and then a subset of them, which is the M, that's that's when you have the uh, um, the observation more, of more y. expensive operations. Yeah, and uh, the 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 questions. Also, I am a little bit. Uh, I am. Mm. Um, Sorry, I cannot hear you clearly. M. Okay. Um, Jenguan, uh, we we lost you at the point where you were saying. Um, oh, oh, sorry, I I did not hear clearly what. Yep. Uh, could you repeat what you said? Okay, sure, sure. So what I'm asking is that uh, the um, because n is also uh, just a larger sample, right? It, it is also a sample. So uh, I'm just uh, saying that there's an interesting case there when the and the um, a mu n itself is not necessarily a random sample, and uh, and then um, that sampling design could have a, a different impact on how you select a mu m or construct the confidence interval. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Let, let's come to this uh, result. Our result is actually based on our. This result is actually based on this result. This result assumes that the mu n are 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 constructed in IID case. So if it's not IID, then we do not have this high probability inequality, and that would be a problem for us to to deal with. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I came in uh, late, so I didn't uh, didn't get to hear your first part of the presentation. Uh -huh. uh, uh, however, uh, I, I have a question regarding the um, k medial, uh, k medioid, met metroid, uh, k medioid, yeah, yeah, k medial medioid uh, algorithm and the Wasserstein distance. So, mm -hmm. uh, why is there a connection between these? Is that have, well, it, it seems the uh, the output from the k medioid uh, algorithm happen to give you the uh, minimizer of the Wasserstein distance. Is that correct? 
uh, I, I want to say actually, if we look carefully, the the definitions of of the K more K uh, the the Watson distance uh, expressed in the optimal transport way. I, I'm sorry, I did not uh, present it here. But if we use the optimal transport way, uh, we write the Watson distance. We can see that that is exactly the same as the K needle is do. Okay, yeah, thanks. That's my yeah. question. Uh -huh. And uh, I have some follow up questions. So, uh -huh. uh, well, you are working on L1 Watson's time distance. One yes. Watson's time. Uh, what about two Watson's time? Will you then use a K? Uh, because, uh, because, uh, because two Watson's time is always stronger than one Watson's time. And in our case, uh, the most natural choice is, 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 I think, is the one Watson's distance because we want to bound the the difference between two functions, the expected value of two functions, and which is Lipschitz, and it's natural choice. For two Wasserstein distance, I, I'm also considering about it, but but currently I don't know where it should go in in this framework. Ah, uh, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that, uh, I was just conjecturing since K Mandelbrot and algorithm give you the minimizer. For the one losses time, maybe k means give you that for two losses time. Oh yeah, k means there is a problem is that we must use k medoids because we want the k the points in the original data set. But k means will give you uh, non-existent data data points. Uh, That's but the you problem. can still apply the same principle. You can require the the, the center points to be in sample. The, the, sorry, to, to to be what? You can require the centers to be uh, in sample. So is, is that right? K meet Mandroid, um, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Because K meet OS only selects points within the original data set. But K means we can find something not in the original data set. Okay, so you are using K meet Mandroid with the Euclidean distance, is that right? Uh, yes, actually we can also use the uh, use not only the L2 norm, we can also use the L1 norm. I've checked that there's no uh, qualitative difference. I see. Okay, mm -hmm. I see. That's interesting. Yeah, thank uh, you. Uh, yeah. yeah, I have a, a one last question. Uh -huh. um, so it's, um, so in your uh, experiments application, you consider linear model and uh, random forest. So yeah. You mentioned uh, the geometry of the data. So um, the Wasser's time distance captured the uh, uh, Euclidean geometry. Uh, I, I thought a more uh, natural uh, uh, a classifier or predictor prediction uh, to use is the k, k, k nearest neighbor uh, mm -hmm. algorithm, uh, k nearest neighbor prediction instead of the random forest. So for k nearest, so your conjecture is uh, Wasser's, Wasser's time distance can capture the Euclidean geometry, so it would play well with the linear model. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you would also play well with the k nearest neighbor uh, 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 KNN algorithms. Okay, uh, I have not checked that previously. Yeah, it's just yeah, a yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I will consider about that. Oh, yeah, this is Lady Wang. I have oh, a question hi. for you. Uh, uh, sorry, I also came a little bit late, so I must, might have missed a few slides. So I want to uh, clarify uh, the whole motivation. So okay. you are doing like, uh, you take the expected value difference. Uh, so I'm wondering why you only consider that, why don't you consider like uh, uh, efficiency, like the variation? Well, yeah, these are, these are sure, surely, is deserving to be to be considered, uh, but but at, at at this stage, even to bound the the difference in expectation is 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 not that easy. Actually, we are comparing. Uh, uh, we, we actually we we want to bound the difference in expectation by by the what like what's the distance? What's the distance is in, in indeed a uh, a a comparison of two probability measures from a global perspective. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I think it provides several uh, uh, information, not only 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 
about the, the mean, also about some higher orders of statistics. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, I got you. And then uh -huh. my second question is, uh, uh, like uh, in your estimation, I, I thought you, you, you have a model somewhere. Um, so it, you use this model as like a model assisted estimation. Um, so what, what's the role of the model here? Oh, actually, uh, what, what our main result here is that no matter the model we select, we have a worst case are, uh, are bound for the estimated uh, risk. It, so model here only serves as if we want to choose a model uh, numerically, we can do that. But uh, what we have established for the theoretical result is the worst case bound. So no matter how, how we choose the, choose the predictor, how we choose the loss function, as long as they satisfy the boundedness and the Lipschitz conditions, yeah, we can have that bound. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you again. Thank you, thank for, you. Uh, for doing this talk and for doing the Q&A. Can I have um, some more questions? Uh-huh. Uh, so, I, uh -huh. yes. Um, I, I just, uh, I, I'm a, a little bit puzzled about the, the uh, intuition behind the, this. Uh, uh, so basically, you are, you're trying to cluster the data and then select one representative from each of the clusters, right? Uh, the algorithm, from the algorithm perspective, yes. And uh, so, what are your numerical results show that it works best for the linear model, but not so much for the mm -hmm. uh, nonlinear model? The, yes. Uh, I think in the linear model case, there's actually more research on subsampling. Um, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have compared that with things like uh, information-based optimal subsampling approach. Uh, what, what do you mean by information-based? So there's a paper by um, John Stafkin and uh, Min Yang and uh, um, Wang, uh, Haying Wang or something. Okay, I, 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 I'm not sure whether this paper is the one I, I once looked at, but they assume that the, the model is, the underlying model is, is something. Linear model, yeah. Linear model, yes, is something, okay. yes. So yes, but- In the linear but, model case, you are, mm -hmm. you're, so basically your, your method right now is better than, uh, better than the uh, leverage method in the linear case. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think if you are, want to make a case that this is good, then, then you also need to uh, compare that with, with the one that is known have, to have better performance. Like uh, that method I was mentioning, their paper showed that the, their method was also much better than the leverage sampling case. Mm -hmm. so, so you may want to compare your, uh, your approach with that as well. That, that's a very extremely easy method to implement. Okay, okay, thank you. And for the nonlinear case, I, I, I feel that uh, just uh, in, in this case, essentially, if you have unequal sized clusters, mm -hmm. uh, then basically your sampling weight from each of those clusters will be different. You will sample less in the larger clusters. I'm, I'm wondering why intuitively that, that, that is better, that uh, uh, seems to be not clear to me why, why that will work in a nonlinear case. For for non linear predictor, our 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 sub was a certain distance based subsampling in the feature space is not necessarily better. It's it's so so what what do you mean? So what what is your proposal? Your proposal is the unweighted. Uh, it works uh, better in the in linear model, yeah. Okay, so so you don't have anything for the non linear model yet. Yeah, for a non linear model, there is no clear conclusion currently. Yeah. Yet. Oh, I also have a follow-up, uh, Yang. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now that I clear up my mind a little bit, so what I meant was, if your uh, Wasser's time distance is uh, two Wasser's time distance, uh, one could apply uh, the same k matrix algorithm, but with a different distance function. Use the square Euclidean distance instead of the Euclidean distance. Then mm -hmm. the minimizer would be the uh, was a two Wasser's time distance. Minimizer. Yes, we we have yeah numerically we can do that yeah. Yeah, right. And one can even generate this. Generalize to P, this yeah. To yeah, to P or, yes, yes, yes. Now to capture arbitrary geometry. Yeah, actually, uh, in my opinion, if we can correctly select the right distance definition uh, that is consistent with the data geometry, then we can have better idea, uh, better results. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, agree. I, I will agree. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for attending and thank you Jan, Jan again for uh, giving this talk. Thank you. Uh, 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 at this point, we will stop for the uh, for the afternoon. Uh, have a good day, everybody. Bye bye now. Bye.